MPH Sports Podcast. Talk sport and property with sports people discussing their careers and how property played a part in it. Fraser Friends, welcome to Talk Sport and Property. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Lee. Thank you for having me on, mate. Oh, thank you. Pleasure's all ours, mate. I know you're a fan of the pods, but just so everyone's aware what we tend to do and uh, just to remind yourself that we break this pod into two halves. First half, we're going to talk about your favourite subject, which is uh, football or sport. And then we're going to go on to my favourite subject, which is mm-hmm. property. So let's talk about your career, Fraser. 30 years of age, born in Hammersmith, West London, just near me. 320 professional career appearances, playing for Brentford, Basingstoke. AFC Wimbledon, Hazen Yedding, Welling United, Luton Town, Stevenage, and Newport County. But it all started at my beloved Chelsea Football Club. What age did you sign for the academy and where did you fall in love with football, Fraser? You made me sound like a right journeyman there, listening to them in clubs. Um, fell in love with football really early and I was, I was a besotted Chelsea fan uh, as a kid. And I signed for the academy at a nine, as a nine-year-old. And it wasn't, you know, most people have to get scouted. And my route wasn't like that. I think there was a Chelsea development centre. So I used to go to all the soccer schools in the in the summers. There was a development centre, which is a, I think they call them like shadow squads now. It was nothing really to do with Chelsea, but the coach wore the Chelsea kit. So it was, it was part of Chelsea. And that was actually closing down. They, so they'd shut it down. And they said, just before we close, we're going to have a match against Chelsea's academy. And we got beat, I think it was 14-0. In the, in the game, we were we were terrible, um, but Chelsea were really good. It was their under nineteen, and I remember crying my eyes out during the game because I thought it was embarrassing and all that kind of stuff. But they saw something in me. They just saw that I kept running basically, and I was trying to do my best, that kind of thing. And they got a letter um, afterwards saying I'd, I've got a trial, and that was it. I went down as a as a nine year old. I actually accidentally trialed in the under tens, which probably helped me in the long run. Uh, there was two of us that got picked for a trial, and he was a year older than me. And instead of me going on my own, I thought, right, I just need to cling on to my mate because I was nervous as anything. So we trialled in the under-10s. And then a few weeks later, they said, we checked your date of birth and you actually belong down there. Probably probably good for me because it was a bit easier when I went to the under-9s. But but yeah, that was my, my route into the academy system. And how long did you start charity for? I was there for seven years. So yeah, I left. I didn't get a scholarship. But yeah, I went through those age groups. Obviously, as a Chelsea fan as well, I you know, absolutely loved it. I was one of these kids, though, that I try and talk to, to young kids now in, in the role that I do. But I, I remember being at the age of nine and ten and being an absolute nervous wreck. And I want kids to enjoy the football. And I was one of those that was really sort of tense and nervous. And I think as I got older and probably as I left Chelsea, I, I got a bit more confident and but I was always a little bit in awe of being there. I think because I was a fan, I always feared being released every year. I was thought I was going to get released. But no, as, an, as an education and it, it, as an experience, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, and no, I can imagine it was. I mean, what a great place to come to really learn your craft. Because in 2007, you joined Brentford as an apprentice. I think at the time you were about 17. He was named in the first team squad against Swansea in August 2008 and you signed your first professional senior contract in the summer of 2009. I mean how did you find your time at the Beans? How was it different to, to Chelsea? Was there a bit of a gap between leaving the academy at Chelsea and, and joining Brentford? A little. I, I got released from Chelsea and they, they have an aftercare policy where they, they try and get me trials elsewhere and they got me a trial at Millwall and I went to Millwall and it's just one of those really long extended trials where they weren't making a decision. They were saying, yeah, we want to keep looking at you. And it got to the end of the season and they said, yeah, come back pre-season. And I thought, I know what that means. You're not having me. So I had to then off my own back, try and find a trial for myself. And I knew someone that was at Brentford and I just got his dad to, to ring up and see if the coach needed a right back. And they just said, come down and train. Very different. It was uh, yeah, unorganised. There was no kit or anything like that, but I loved it. I was one of them that I didn't care about any of that kind of stuff, facilities, and that didn't really mean anything to me. I went there and I had a new lease of life because I was probably, I was always sort of clinging on at Chelsea. I was probably at the, you know, the bottom four or five players and then just getting a new deal. But I went to Brentford and I was, I was like, actually, I could be one of the better players here. So in a weird way, being released actually gave me that lift. But 
absolutely loved it at Brentford, um, especially that's those scholarship years. Didn't go as well as I'd hoped when I when I signed that first year pro, but it was very different. No reserve team on the 23 team. So at 18 years old and a, a centre half, you had to be ready to go straight into the first team. I was on the bench most weeks, but looking back, I was I thought I was ready at the time. I was knocking on the manager's office saying, why am I playing? But looking back, I probably wasn't ready and I needed to go away and have a, a bit of an alternative career path. Right. Well, look, in, in 2010, only two months later after passing away to Brentford, you signed for AFC Wimbledon on a one-year deal. I mean, again, nice and local to you, Fraser. I mean, did you feel like that was a, a good move? Because it wasn't the ideal start to the season for you personally, was it? No, it was. I, when, when AFC Wimbledon showed an interest, I was over the moon because they were... They were in the conference, but they were getting sellouts every week. And it was, you know, I grew up playing against the old Wimbledon and I knew the history of the club and I knew that they'd end up going through the leagues and I was desperate to be there. And I had to trial. So it was one of them. You, it's hard as a, when you're a first team player, especially going on trial with another club, it's quite risky. I had a couple of offers from the league below where I've been alone at, but I went on trial and Quite a funny story with the trial, actually. They, they had me and another centre-half on trial. And they said, we have, we've got a budget that we need to stick to. And it's £300 um, for a centre-back, uh, £300 a week. And I was never on big money at Brentford. And my first pro deal was £150 a week. I think people from the outside sometimes think you're earning more than you are. And you, you, might, let, you might let them believe that. But there was two of us and we were, we were neck and neck, really, the whole of pre-season, both doing well. And they said it was a bit like the Mill one. They were like, yeah, we want to extend it a little bit more and have a look at you because, you know, this coach wants you and this coach wants you and I'm a bit torn. And me and him went outside and we just said, look, it's £300 here for a centre-back. Shall we just take 150 each and both sign? We'll go back in there now and just say, look, give us a deal. And then if we do well, you can up our money. We went back in there. And yeah, me, me and him have been surprising. We were competition when we first went there, so I didn't like him. But, <laughs> He was he was groomsman at my wedding. We had, he's been one of my best mates over the years, and it's one of the one of the best decisions I made was was going back in the office and taking taking less money. But it wasn't about money for me. It was about the experience of going and playing men's football at, at a top club. And yeah, I absolutely loved it at Wimbledon. As you say, it wasn't the ideal start. We went there as third and fourth choice basically, and we had to wait to get our chance. They're two experienced ones, but there was a. It's funny how, how luck plays its part because we had um, we had a TV game against Crawley and it was us and Crawley that were the top two. Crawley had splashed out big money and it was about 10 games in and we, we hadn't played, neither of us. We were on the bench and that kind of thing. Two, both centre-backs came down ill before the game. So we turned up for the game, like the biggest game of the season and they just said to us, right, you two are starting. And it was both our debuts and we were like, flip and hell. But it was probably the best way it could have happened because we didn't have time to get nervous or anything like that. We got chucked in on telly, full house, against top of the league. <laughs> Put a food poisoning in there, right? Oh. Yeah, me, yeah, a bit of dodgy lasagna the other day before. Um, but now we, we got chucked in on this game and, yeah, we, we won the game. We both did really well, man of the match, all that kind of stuff. And then that was it. We, I, I, in particular, got my chance after that game and had a run in the team. Yeah, absolutely loved it. But the only... It would, it would have been the sort of ideal season for me. The only bad point was we got to the playoffs and just before the playoffs, I had a, a game at Grimsby away and went in for a tackle and done my knee ligaments and that put me out for the best part of a year. So I ended up missing the playoff final and all that kind of stuff. But that, that playoff final day is still probably my best memory in football, even though I didn't play. It was like a, a real team effort. We had a great set of boys. We got a trip to Vegas when we won it. And it was, yes, yeah, an unbelievable experience. I absolutely love that year. Oh, brilliant. Well, despite all of that, I mean, you still managed to play enough games to trigger a further one-year deal after that injury. And, and I know you've experienced a couple of loan moves as well. I think, first of all, it was Hazen Yedding, just for match fitness, really. And, and then you explored your first experience at Newport County. How do loan moves help a young player like, like yourself, Razor? And, and how does it sort of help you progress into your career? I think you've got to go into it with the right mentality. And I, I didn't, I'm really honest in saying that these two loan spells, I did not want to go on loan. I definitely didn't want to go on loan to Hayes and Yedden. They were, they were in the conference, so they, they were, you know, it was an okay level at that time. We were in League Two then. But I wanted to, I wanted to stay at Wimbledon and just get playing. But because I'd had the best part of a year out, they sent me on loan. Um, and I went there sulking, basically. I went there with the wrong attitude. 
did okay, but went through the motions a little bit. And I was like, right, I'm back at Wimbledon now. And yeah, I, I didn't put put in enough. I didn't go there with the right attitude. But I then went to Newport County on loan, and that was that was completely different. I actually obviously knew Newport was a bigger club. I wanted to go there. It was full time. Meant me living in a hotel for for a long period. But it was a nightmare loan spell, if I'm honest. It was uh, they had a lot of injuries at Newport, and they we had eight loan players in the in the, in the squad. And in my first my first game that I played, it was away at Lincoln. The only game that I played, we had eight players on the pitch, loan players, and the rules state that you can only have five in a squad. So the club got fined afterwards, and it meant that three loan players had to miss out every week. So I was on there on loan, but the centre back that I'd come to replace was now fit. So I was I was on loan, but I had to sit in the stands every week because I you know, couldn't couldn't get in the squad. So you're away from home just to sit on the bench, just to make up the numbers, yeah. And it was it was one of them. I couldn't go back either. The good thing about it was there was just so I understand why couldn't you go back to AFC Wimbledon? Because I'd signed. A, I think it was a three month loan, so I'd gone there and you couldn't you couldn't then go back. Right. But it was the good thing for me was there was. There's four or five of us uh, in the hotel as well. A really good lads. One of them's Carl Darlow. He's in the Premier League now at Newcastle. But you had Justin Edinburgh was living there as well with us, um, the assistant manager. So there was like a, a good collective of us. And, I, you know, I was I was frustrated that I weren't playing, but I, I did really enjoy it at Newport. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't... I went back to Wimbledon after that and it just couldn't get back in the team. And it was towards the end of the season and, and that was it, yeah. After you left... AFC Wimbledon, I mean, you, you decided against playing for other sort of higher profile clubs and you, you agreed to deal with Welling United in the Conference South. I mean, did you see that as a move, maybe a step back to go forward? Yeah, definitely. I think it probably hurt my ego a little bit because it's the first time I ever went part time. And that summer, everyone had spoken, I'd spoken to a number of clubs, some in the league, some in the conference, and they were saying, yeah. We want you in, but, you know, I see you being a squad player and then, you know, coming through. And I just, everyone was saying I was inexperienced and I just knew that I needed to go somewhere and not give people this excuse. So if I went somewhere and I was going to play every single week, I thought if I go to Welling, it's a club where I know for a fact loads of scouts go and watch. You've got Charlton, Gillingham, Palace, all these, um, you know, it's a London club that a lot of teams go and watch. And there's been some players that have come through. And I spoke to the manager and he just said, look, come here, get your head down. We're looking to get promoted this year. If you have a good season, someone will see you and you'll go off. And he said, that's what we want. And I just bought into it. Um, it was completely different, like training in the evenings. And it was, you know, some of these lads uh, were great players, by the way. That, you know, were playing part-time for various reasons, had good jobs or dropped out of the game, that kind of thing. I think sometimes you just need a place where you can actually fall in love with the sport again. Because... Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're not getting the minutes that you, you need and you don't feel the value, then naturally you just need an opportunity just to enjoy playing the game, winning matches, getting the minutes under your belt. And um, and look, to be honest, as you said, it, it, it worked. I mean, you were named in the team of the year. I mean, you even signed a, a, another one-year deal, but you had so many other interests from, from other clubs. I mean, can we discuss that? Yeah, yeah. I think I, at that point, I just needed a bit of love. I needed someone to go, you're a good player and you're going to start every week for me. And that's, that's what it was. And I think a lot of players are like that. You need it. I think mentally it, it made me grow. It made me feel like I was a good player. Because when you've been, you know, I got knocked back from Chelsea, made my way back, got knocked back from Brentford. Then I got knocked back from Wimbledon. And you start doubting yourself a little bit. And you need someone to go, look, you're going to play for me. And, you know, I believe in you, basically. And that's what it was. And, yeah, we did really well. We got promoted. I think a big a big shot window for me as well was getting called up to the England C team. That team that we had, every single player has gone on to get a move. And it's a frightening team. You've got players in the Premier League, Championship. And that was a shot window for me. And that, that really helped me. And then the next season, well in, the reason I signed another deal was I had some interest, but it wasn't what I wanted. And I just thought, if I can hold on a bit longer, I'll get a better club. And luckily, yeah, that's what happened. Good. Yeah, I mean, after 60 appearances for the club in January 2014, you agreed uh, terms with Luton Town. I think they activated your release clause and you signed for, for them. I mean, did you feel this was the, the right club for you at that point after sort of dropping down the level? And yeah, I mean, like, how did you find your two years at Luton Town? 
I always I always get a gut feeling when I go somewhere and I, I trust it quite a bit. And I'll be honest, the, the club, I went and I spoke to Stevenage, Colchester. They were both in League One at the time. But I went to Forest Green and they were in the conference. Something about me just was just drawn to, and I said, I want to sign for this club. Like, I know there's bigger clubs in for me, but they, 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 they said, you're going to sign and you're going to be captain. Um, you know, we're going to build a team around you at Forest Green, yeah. So it's a little bit like what I'd had at Welling, but on a on a bigger scale, full time, and that really appealed to me. And then last minute, Luton came in for me, and I was like, "Look, I need to go and have a look at Luton." And I went there, and it was just the level of actual club and the fan base and the stadium and all that just sucked me in. And I just thought, I can't turn down this club. I need to go and you know, this is another club that I think can go through the leagues, and they've shown that. So yeah, once I went there, I say I still had a thing in my part that was like is this the right thing to do I know it's a big club but and I was like yeah let's just go for it and um it started off great if I'm honest I was you know I went there and John Steele said look you're going to be main man and you're going to play every week and it happened I played every game when I went there and we got promoted Andre Gray was quite a big influence on me in there because me and him got close to England C I could ask him questions and he was saying look come down and and yeah it, it went it went perfect for the first six months I'd say and then we got promoted, but we signed loads of players. And I always thought that I was maybe there to do a job to get us promoted. And then someone else was going to come in because Luton had a decent budget. And the second season, I'd signed a two and a half year deal. So I still had two years left after promotion. Um, but they'd signed a lot of players. We had, we'd have 10, 10 to 12 players that weren't getting in a training session. So you'd have 11 v 11 and then 12 lads on the side training on their own with a coach. So it was a huge squad. There was some, they shouldn't really be at League Two, but there was quite a few egos and people thinking they had big money and all that kind of stuff. And it just wasn't the same feeling that I'd had at Welling. And I found it tough that second year. I think um, I've made a few mistakes. My form weren't great. Fans, a few fans started getting on my back a little bit. And yeah, I just thought I got to the end of that season. I had a year left of my contract, but I was like, I need to leave. I'm not playing regularly and I'm too old to be sitting in the stands now we need to go again play week, week in week out somewhere and you did so you signed for their well, neighbours in Stevenage I mean it, it sounds like this first season is almost unbelievable and I'm, I'm going to read this out to you so 42 appearances three goals fans player of the year players player of the year we just won a hell of a season Fraser what was the difference between Stevenage and Luton was it, was it or was it just confidence I think I put I put a lot in my career down to the mental side of it. And I think it was, I didn't feel like I was, I felt a, a little bit of a bit part player at Luton at times. And again, you go to Stevenage and at the time it was actually Teddy Sheringham. So it's like, this is like my childhood hero. And when he phones you up and says, look, come and play for me, you'll enjoy it. I did I, straight away. I took a pay cut, signed there. And again, it felt like that feeling at Welling where someone's going, look, you're a good player. You, you can play at this level. Because that's what I was always trying to prove. I was always, I'd always get to the football league and then have a little setback and end up back in non-league. And you know, I've been in non-league three seasons of my career. When I look back, and I won promotion every season, but then the next season wasn't quite as I'd hoped. Um, so this was someone I was like, right, I'm going to go here. I'm going to play. My target was to play over 100 games, which I managed. But I went there like straight away. Small differences like the fans singing your name, and it's you know, it was less fans. It was you know, we were getting maybe 4,000 where Luton were getting 10,000 but when you've got fans singing your name and you're seeing people with your, the name on the back of your shirt and stuff those little things make you feel make you feel good and I went there and I just yeah I felt at home straight away managed to actually finally sort of establish myself as a as a football league player really well what was Teddy's man management skills like then for you for me I, I got on really really well with him he I think the frustration that he had was he's used to play with playing with top class players and the season before he'd been a coach at West Ham so still he's playing he's training Premier League players I think when you when you go from that and the standard is so high I think you got a little bit frustrated where people couldn't do what he was what he could do basically so if he's taking a forwards drill probably couldn't understand why they can hit the back of the net every time and then he'd go and demo it at his age still mate, he still have a six back and everything he still looked a million dollars and he'd go and put one in the top corner 
And he's like, why can't you just do that? And it's, I think that was a bit of a frustration for him. But man, management wise, I think he was, he was brilliant for me. You know, there was a, even if there was, you know, an issue off the pitch or something, he'd call you in, he'd ask if you're okay. He just, he didn't get enough time, but he probably didn't know the level as well as he hoped. Um, I'm sure there are things he'd go back and change. But for me, I can only speak speak uh, good things about him. Ah, fantastic. Well, look, you spent three seasons at Stevenage um, with some really impressive stats before heading to Newport County. What the move? That was, um, there'd been a couple of manager changes. Uh, I was at the coming to the end of my contract and they just offered me a new one. But it was it was Dino Mamria that came in and he's a, he's a really good guy, actually. I got on well with him off the pitch. Just his training methods for me, it was just sprinting everywhere. It was running all the time and took the enjoyment out of it a little bit for me. Speaking to some of the players in the squad, some were getting off a pay cut, some were being released. Um, and it just felt like that team was breaking up. Mm. And clubs knew that I was out of contract. And one of the first, or the first club that contacted me was Newport. Just said, would you be interested? Off the pitch, it was a, a longer contract. It was better money. It was... I felt like I, it was getting a little bit stale at Stevenage um, and that I just needed a change. I sort of had a look and saw what other options I had, but again, I went with that gut feeling and Newport was, uh, again, turned out to be a, the best move for me at that time. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's at Newport County where you experienced a completely life-changing few months, isn't it, Fraser? I mean, would you mind sharing your story with me and our followers? Because... What you went through is incredible, actually. It's, I've gotten used to talking about it a little bit more now. So I, <clears throat> I almost talk about it and take the emotion out of it. But that, that season I signed there, and I was, um, you know, that's when I felt like a real senior player. I felt like an old, uh, an old head. You know, I was captain in the team and that kind of thing. We had a really good season, good FA Cup run, beat Leicester, added Man City in the last 16. But it was, I think it was, it was only three, game, three days after that Man City game that we played back in the league. Notts County it was. It's actually the last game I ever played, but I scored in it. I scored the first goal of the game. Uh, we won the game 4-1. About 10 minutes to go, I just felt leggy, felt out of breath, didn't feel good at all, a bit dizzy. Sat down on the floor and just, I just said, oh, I need to go off here. We were 4-1 up at the time, so when we had a couple of subs left, so I just said, I don't feel great, I need to go off. And then came, came back and I just thought I was coming down with the flu or something. It didn't feel great. I stayed. Yeah, just in bed and I was going, I was cold, but I was sweating and shivering and that kind of thing. Then I started to get like a racing sort of chest and got a little bit worried, but nothing too major. And then it was, it was in the sort of in the night where I just couldn't sleep and it, this chest was going and getting a bit more painful. And I just tapped my wife and just said, look, I need to go to hospital here. Probably delayed it longer than I should have because she was seven months pregnant at that time. So I didn't want to get her up and well, I didn't want to I didn't want to get an ambulance because I thought they're going to say this is nothing so she she drove me to hospital and they went in and they took my heart rate and it was about I think it was like 240 or something like that so it was off the charts took me in and just they treated me for for sepsis at first so they thought I had a blood infection and then I was in hospital for a couple of weeks loads of tests and stuff and then it came back that it was a heart issue and that I I had a I had a scan at Brentford when I was 16 that showed I had an irregular heartbeat but nothing that was going to sort of mean I had to stop playing football, but it, it had developed and I'd gained another sort of uh, problem in the heart as well. And when they'd seen that, they just said, look, this is, it's unsafe for you to carry on. Um, they said, you don't need an operation yet because mine, once it gets to severe, you need an operation. Mine was on the edge of moderate to severe. So they said, if you can carry on, you know, take your lifestyle down a little bit. Obviously, if I'm playing football, I'm pushing myself to the limit. So if you, they said to me, if you, if you retire, well, you need to retire because it's unsafe for you to continue. But if you retire now, um, you might not have to have this operation because we can manage it and moderate it. So I've been doing that and I've got regular scans. This is fast forwarding, but now it, it turns out that I do actually need the operation. So I need a mechanical valve. So that's open heart surgery. My valve um, taking out a metal one, putting in, and then another procedure while they're in at the same time. But But that was it. That was sort of, the weird thing when I look at it is that Man City game was probably in that Leicester game with two of the biggest of my career. And it was only like days after that that it's like you get this big high and then straight back down, like career done. And I think people had always said to me, look, you know, it only takes one tackle or you never think that's going to happen to you. And yeah, that was it. It was uh, two years ago this month, actually, because it was middle of March. 
So that was it. That was the, that Notts County game was, was the last game that I ever played. I mean, how did you how did you feel when the doctor said you need to retire from football? A little bit. I don't know. I don't really know. I think I think they slowly started to introduce the idea to me. I had a, a doctor in there that um, was into his football and was just coming for a chat. And he said, look, he just sat down casually. I think he was watching a game on the iPad or something. And he just said, look, I've seen something on your scan. He said, look, if it, if it is what I think it is, then this could, he said, this could have sort of big implications for your career. And then he'd keep dropping things in. So he didn't come out of it suddenly. And I started to get in my head, look, like, and I was like, this, this could be the end. And I think once he came in the final time of about, honestly, about 10 to 12 doctors around the bed, where they had different opinions and they'd not really seen this kind of thing in someone so young. Yeah, at that point, it was, I, I was mainly panicking that, yeah, my career's over, but what am I going to do now? Financially, I'm not a Premier League player, I'm not secure. I've got hardly any savings, my wife's pregnant. So that was, I almost put the career to bed. Yeah, I was going to say, that's overtaking the, yeah. the process behind not kicking the ball again. I think, I think, I honestly think that was one of the last things I thought. I thought, yeah, I'm, you know, my career's done, but what about all this stuff? I've got all this baggage now that I need to sort out. So it probably it didn't give me time to look back and sort of, might be a good thing in hindsight, but it didn't give me that time to look back and go, oh my God, this has happened. It just made me move on straight away. Yeah, there were times where I was panicking and not knowing what to do next and that kind of thing, but Newport were brilliant with me. Um, like unbelievable like what they what they did to look after me uh they didn't have to do and I think as harsh as it sounds if I did this at another club that I'd been at maybe I wouldn't have got the same treatment and I wouldn't have I would have uh, been in a, a lot worse position a lot, lot darker um so they I owe so much to them and I've always said now like my kids will grow up and they'll be Newport fans my nephew's a Newport fan um and yeah I've got I was only there I look back and I was there for a season, not even that because it got cut short. But I absolutely love that club and the people that of that of that um city. You know, it's a it's a real working class city, but I, I obviously found out that they'd do anything to help people and yeah, absolutely love my time there. Do you have a um do you have a date for the operation? No, I think again this is one of the most frustrating parts of it. I think um I think it will be within the next year. I actually spoke to the British Heart Foundation this morning because I'm going to be doing a little bit of charity work for them and they're going to sort of help me get consultations and things like that. But I think the next step is uh, getting booked in with a surgeon and then um, what they have to take into consideration is once I have this operation that I'm going to be on medication for life, basically, and that's blood thinners. Um, so that's every single day I'm going to have to have my blood taken. I have to go to the hospital once a week for the first few years, it's every single week you have to go to hospital for, for your blood taken. Tablet every single day. You have to moderate what you eat, what you drink, sort of what you do. And it's obviously it's a big deal. It's um, you know, if you if you cut yourself, you're gonna bleed loads because it's blood thinners. If you get someone squeezes you, you're gonna bruise really easily. So you've got all these things that that come with this medication. So that I think their thought process is look, if we can hold on as long as possible then you haven't got to take this medication for as long. But I'm one of these people that I'd rather have good medication than this operation hanging over me. I think if I have this operation, get it done, move on. Yes, I'm going to have to alter a few things in my life and be on medication, but you know, that, that's fine by me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go as soon as. Good. Well, listen, Fraser, um, I know we've not spoken about this yet, but let's off this pod. Let's talk about what we can do in collaboration to support you and the British Heart Foundation, yeah? Yeah, brilliant, yeah. Good, we can do that. Thank mm-hmm. you for that with us. This is the part of the pod we're going to do a quick fire round, a quick question fire round, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. fire away. Do you have a nickname? <laughs> I've got a nickname called Spud, and it is, uh, well, it's from the AFC Wimbledon days, but I, I basically, how it came about was I went on a team coach and I had a, an old, old, really old laptop. This is 10 years ago now, but a really old laptop from school. And someone went on it and found a picture. And I'm from Battersea and I'm from a council estate. I knew a lot of rude boys back in the day and some of So Solid Crew. Uh, <laughs> and there's a picture. Of, do you remember Romeo from So Solid Crew? He's a lot of it. Yeah, so I'm with him. 
and we've obviously said let's get a picture together and I remember it so clear that he said go like that and fist bump me and there's a picture of me and him fist bumping and Spud came out of it because everyone just goes Spud and put your fist up and that's how it came about and there's an assistant manager that has called me that and he texts me regularly calls me Spud every single time that I see him so that's one that did stick a little bit for me but yeah that's brilliant well, I think I know the answer to this great Nick question. Who do you support? Chelsea. But to be honest... Newport County, I'm assuming. <laughs> and Newport County, yeah. I say that. I grew up a Chelsea fan, but I have... It weren't just because they released me, but I have, I've grown completely away from it. I think when... I don't know if other players feel like this, but when you when you play, I, I just I just fell out of... fell out of love with the club. I just stopped supporting them. And just, yeah. But Newport, I always cheer Newport on now, yeah. Who's more famous, you or your missus? <laughs> I'd say, yeah, I'd say her. <laughs> She's got more followers, put it that way. For those that don't know, yes, um, your, wife, your wife is Stacey from S Club Juniors, isn't she? How is she? Is she yeah. well? Yeah, she is well. She got the, um, I think some magazine actually did an article on this the other day, but she got the short show. They said three of, I think three of them ended up with footballers. <laughs> and uh, one's with Wayne Bridge, one's with John Joe Shelby. So they're getting the Premier League top dogs and she's lumbered with me from, from League Two, so. <laughs> yeah. She won. Your favourite stadium you've ever played? Probably not the, the best, but the favourite one I played at was Portsmouth. I used to love it. Um, and we, we when I was at Stevenage, uh, we did really well there. But they were always, it was always a full house and like a league game. It weren't like you were on a, an underdog. That was an unbelievable atmosphere, yeah. The fans are really close to the pitch there, aren't they? Yeah, great atmosphere. And my family aren't too far away so they would all come up for that one as well so yeah I love that one Would you like to coach or manage at some point in your career? Uh, no don't. well I don't think so I've done my B licence and stuff like that I get a passion for helping players off the pitch not so much for going and putting on a session um, I'd never say never but I'm at this point I don't see it No sure because the reason why I was so keen to ask this question because I know you enjoy your scouting work at Bristol City don't you? Yeah I imagine knowing a lot of work and your personality that you do off the pitch with the players, I would have thought that if you could coach them, that would maybe have a more positive impact in their, in their playing career. But yeah. I think I think a lot of people were surprised when I didn't. And I almost felt guilty for it because I thought everyone was saying, you know, you've been a captain, you, you talked a lot on the pitch, going to coaching. But I, I just don't think it's for everyone. I think um, I haven't tried it enough. I'll probably say that as well. But at this point, I've got other interests around football that I prefer than, than coaching at the minute. Yeah. Your next dream job? Oof. I think, um, you know, the business I'm doing now, if I can mould mold that to how I want it and, you know, I feel like my purpose is almost is, is helping other people. So I want to give other people opportunities. Um, I want to change a few things in football. So I'm, I'm working with academies all the time. Using, using my experience and my experience in the game, there's, there's things that I want to change. So I just want to have an impact on as many people as I can, whether that's inside of football, outside of football, hopefully combining the both, uh, you know, the two. But yeah, changing, helping people, giving people opportunities and, and helping in any way uh, of the next generation of, of players coming through. If you weren't a footballer, and this is if you hadn't of, you know, gone to Chelsea and Brentford and all the other clubs that you played for, <laughs> what would you have gone on to do? Uh, I think something in foot, in sport, maybe PE teaching or something like that. I think this this question always gets put to when you're in school and you say you want to be a footballer and they say, yeah, but every kid wants to be a footballer. And I think my answer to that was probably PE teacher or something like that. I might have gone down the coaching route if I hadn't been a player. I'd probably say that though. Yeah. Best player you've played against? I think you've got, we had that Man City game, but I think the one that's given me the most is Peter Crouch. Yeah. Um, he scored a hat-trick against me. <laughs> yeah, he's, we, had, we had Stoke in the Cup, res, resurrected his career playing against me. He scored three headers. But yeah, he, he gave me a torrid time, so I'd say him. Yeah, I'd say I, I, when I was playing for my Sunday league side, Larksburg, many, many years ago, I used to play for a team called Four Men. So I used to play against him for, for seven seasons, I reckon. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we always beat them. So he scored more against you than he did against me. <laughs> <laughs> Best player you played with? Joby McEnough, I think. Maybe not. Maybe he isn't the technically the best player. Um, there's players that have gone on and maybe done 
other things and better levels and stuff. But he's been a Premier League and an international saying that. But I think for him, someone I learned the most off, someone that I enjoy playing with the most, probably the best professional that I've ever played with. Yeah, no surprise that he's doing so well in management now. And the last question, if you could play one more match, who would it be for and who against? For England, probably. <laughs> uh, against a big dog. Someone like a Brazil, maybe. Yeah. Thanks at the back alongside who? At the minute, go me and John Stones. That'd be a nice culture partnership. What a partnership that is. <laughs> Mate, yeah. got that first half up, well done. Talk Sport and Property Podcast, sponsored by MPH Sports Property Academy. Download the app today from the App Store or Google Play by typing in MPH Sports, the trusted go-to app for sports people looking to buy or learn about property. Fraser, welcome back. We're now going to talk about the property section of the pod. I mean, I reached out to you, it must have been about what, 18 months ago now, um, when I saw you post something on LinkedIn about what had happened to you at Newport, Newport County. And you and I then met, didn't we? And we started to talk about um, opportunities. And you actually came on board and worked with me for a bit. And you were fantastic. It also came at a perfect time, I think, as well, because you were buying your first home and the lender at the time was going to withdraw the mortgage application is that is that right i think it was yeah it was something like that because um but it's the first time i'd ever bought a property and it was when i'd stopped playing football didn't buy any at all during my career but with that i'd obviously retired i had a year left on my contract at newport but they weren't taking that into consideration i had a part-time scout and at bristol city but that weren't enough to, to get the mortgage and then yeah it, it happened that i started working for you and i think I think it might have been maybe a month or so in between and and yeah I managed to obviously work with you and it probably did it probably probably saved me and, and got me on the on the property ladder well I, th- I mean you're you're a very infectious character so likable and what I felt you could do for me was help promote the company help push education and and also, even the way you could speak to property sources across the country and, and help us collectively mm. source trusted properties for players. And, you know, I loved it. And I know, you know, you're obviously you're ambitious at the time. You had lots of other job opportunities. But I've got to say, you know, everything that you did for me at the time mate, was, was absolutely fantastic. And, and I'm glad that we could have helped at that time um, really help you keep your... Your home that you're now living in at the moment. Uh, yeah, no, no, I did. I, I I came out and I was I was completely lost, as I said, and I just wanted to say yes to every opportunity. And I, I was like, I'm not gonna not meet someone because I don't know that industry. And I wanted to do something that I'm passionate about. And this area of players and property and move I've 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 been with my wife now for seven years and we've had we'll be moving into our eighth property together. I've rented since I was I'm mean, say it was local but I actually I actually moved out for the first time when I was 19 and when I was at Wimbledon we got a house share together there was four of us it's four lads from the team and I've I've, I've lived I've lived away from home ever since I've always rented and I've seen the upheaval of moving about and I've seen players make mistakes and it was an area that I was I was really keen to help in because I think a lot of players sign for a club and it's like right off you go you'd have no idea about the area you have no idea you know about anything you need to be good on the pitch and you've got all this worry behind you and you've got a family that you move in and no real help. So I think what you guys do um, really supports that. And that's, that's what the biggest you know draw to me was that there's a massive gap there with, with players and property. And it's, it's one that hopefully, you know, you're going to, you're going to feel when you are feeling. Thank you. Well, I, mean, I also really appreciated you inviting me in my family to your testimonial game. Because I know Newport County from the order range is testimonial. There was arranged against the Chelsea 11, which was right up my street as well. I took the kids. And my mum lives in Wales, so for me to bring my mum to the game as well, and you were brilliant with her, and I met your family and, and Stacey. I mean, you even gave the, the kids a ball each, which is probably still in my garden at the moment, really scared. <laughs> I've got to ask you though, because whilst that was all nice and pretty and, and you were, you know, treated like an absolute hero to the club, I mean, how did you feel watching that game? 
I'm, I'm one of these. I'm, I'm not someone that likes to be the center of attention. No, and I found it, I found it quite uncomfortable at times. Some of the, the I like, I'm, I get quite embarrassed when people compliment me and stuff like that. So when it's like this big game and it's you at the center of it and you're being paraded around the pitch and everyone's speaking to you and that, I, I'm quite uncomfortable with all of it, but watching the actual game is brilliant. I think Chelsea brought down a really good team. You know, if you look at some of those lads, it's a couple of years on now, but I think Billy Gilmore was playing, Conor Gallagher, Mark Gerr, he's at Swansea. I mean, Conor um, yeah, busted, didn't he? I mean, yeah. unbelievable. I think he, from memory, was about eight and one. I think Newport went one nil up. But yeah. I think he scored two or three. I mean, he created the others. I mean, he was yeah. incredible. But you're, you're right. I mean, Chelsea got a fantastic side down. I think even the even the people that the coaching staff, you know, Joe Edwards is someone that I've known since I was a kid and he didn't have to come down and he came down and Neil Barth, the academy manager and Jim Fraser up there. They they didn't need to make the trip, but they they did. And yeah, it meant a lot to me because um a big thing that I talk about with you know my current role is players, you know, being respectful when they're when they're at their clubs because it doesn't always mean that you're gonna be a, a top player, but if you fall out of the game and you've been respectful at a club, they'll try and help you. So for me, if I'd have been you know, messing around or had the wrong attitude at Chelsea. This was so long ago. It was, uh, you know, I've been released by the club 13 years back. Um, but they remembered me for, for having a good attitude and being a good lad. So they were they were happy to help. And I think it's really important for young lads that if they've got that attitude, you know, clubs will want to help you in the future, whether that's after your career, if you drop out. But it was it was perfect for me. It was, you know, Newport against Chelsea. And my brother came on for the last five minutes and uh, I think he, he blew a gasket doing that, but it was a, it was a great day, yeah. I mean, that, that cracked me up. <laughs> and the thing is, is that you two look so similar. So I think when, obviously, your brother's gone on the pitch, with mm-hmm. everyone else probably thought initially, going, oh my God, it's, it's Fraser. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was George playing up front. It, it, it was hilarious. It was really good. <laughs> Did you enjoy the process of buying your first home? And, and in reflection, do you wish you had maybe bought a property earlier in your career? I definitely wish I'd have bought earlier in my career. Um, I just wasn't, I wasn't educated on it at all. And I didn't, I didn't have enough money for a deposit. I think a lot of people that, a lot of my friends, I was on, I was on good money for, for the job, don't get me wrong. When I, when I was a senior player, when I was at Luton from onwards, I was on, I was on good money. Um, not thousands and thousands, but a good wage. But I was never in a position to buy. I don't know if how many people know this. Well, I, I've come from like a council estate and, you know, that was our house and moved into rented accommodation with my mum. And then I moved out um, and started renting from the age of sort of 18, 19. So when you're not on big money and you're paying rent, the actual disposable income or your savings, I didn't have much. So I was living within my means, but not going overboard. And then when you get to a, a period, when I was at Welling, I had a little bit of money saved up. I think it was about five grand. And I was like, right, that's going to go on a deposit or whatever. And then I signed for Luton. And when I signed, when you sign for a club and it's a, a certain distance away, you get relocation money. So I thought, and it was, it was eight grand. And I'm happy to, to share that. That's the, that's the maximum you can get is eight grand. And I think the club can claim certain parts of that back. But that eight grand, I, I got relocation money. And I was like, oh, that is perfect. I can get eight grand plus my five grand. I'll get a little flat and I'll put that down as a, as a deposit. Um, but you can only spend that money on on rent or furniture as a as a you know thing in the in the contract. So I thought if I buy somewhere, I'm going to have to spend eight thousand pound on furniture when I'm a single lad. All I need is a sofa and a bed. So I might as well rent for a year, and I'll say I'll try and save up some money. And that was my plan. With that, I ended up I was on a bit more money. I started doing some of the wrong, making wrong decisions off the pitch, started getting influenced by certain people. I thought I need to, you know, I've signed for a big club now, I need a nice car. So I went and got a Mercedes and spent silly money on that. I then started doing things I'd never done, which was like treating my mates on holidays and stuff like that, or buying designer clothes or trainers. And I got to the end of that and I didn't have, you know, I didn't have much left. I actually got myself into debt. I got a credit card sent to me someone said to me apply for that and you 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 know it'll help you with a mortgage and uh santander sent me 10 grand interest free for five years i think it was and i was like i had no money education or anything like that and they just you know i was like so i can spend 10 grand and then just pay it off monthly and i was like i'll do that i'll do that 
started doing that and going out on nights out and things like that and restaurants. Then I met Stacy as well. So I tried to give it the big and try to, you know, be like, oh, I'll get this on the credit card and take you to a nice place. And it's, I talk about social media a lot in my current job, but if you looked at me on social media, I play in front of 10,000 fans every week. Um, I've got my own place. I'm dressed in designer gear with a Mercedes. I look like I've got everything going on. I'm in debt. I'm, I'm scrambling. I'm in debt. I'm paying this off monthly. Uh, this has now dawned on me that I've made, I've made big mistakes and I need to pay it back. I tried to get rid of the car as, as quick as I could, took a loss on that. And it was until that point that I started to actually think sensibly financially. Um, but by this point, uh, I, I signed for Stevenage on a pay cut. Again, didn't have any savings. And I think with football, where you're moving around so much, it's easy just to go and rent. You get a little bit of relocation money, you go and rent. And I've had you know, countless rentals over the years. And as I said, we're, we're going to be moving into our eighth property together. So this will be my ninth since moving, since, uh, since I've left home at, at 19. Well, I, I know you're buying a new home because I know we've been talking about it on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. and we'll continue to talk about that after this part. What did you learn about the first time of buying, which is going to help you with this one? Because I know there's a couple of little convincing issues yeah. that we're talking about at the moment. But let's be honest, if you were to have bought this as your first home, you're just signing off those little issues and thinking it's not an issue, right? Yeah, 100%. I think the first one um, as well, because I was in Wales and we were we were moving sort of, I say back home, I've not really got a base, but back to not far from Stevenage where, where I'd spent quite a bit of time. I was just desperate. My wife had just given birth, so we've got a baby and she's away from family and doesn't know anyone. So we were just desperate. Um, I was on the phone to solicitors every single day, mortgage people every day, chasing things. Uh, and I think that is good, but obviously I was intense about it and it was just so stressful I think I had no idea what what happened in the mortgage process not a clue no idea how much solicitors would be no idea about no idea about anything and I think the whole process was a was a learning curve for me going into it this time I've, I've tried to be a lot calmer and I am it's the first experience I've had selling a property which has got its own things you've got people coming around and especially during covid it's it can be tough, but we've got that sorted. With this process now, I've, I've been a lot calmer. Um, I know that these things take a little bit of time. You've got to let solicitors get on with their job, but still, you know, still give them the odd nudge to try and speed things up. Um, I think that financially, I think mainly financially, I know what I know what it takes to, you know, mortgage payments now. And I like to think of myself as a lot more sensible with money. Um, I value it a lot more. Uh, and I think that first process has made this one a lot easier, even though this one's got more issues, um, which I hopefully get an ironed out in the next couple of days. But I've been able to be a lot calmer about it. I think it's just experience, isn't it? You know, yeah. you, you highlighted it right at the beginning. You know, you're more experienced. I mean, when we do our, when we do these these buying a property workshops that we do, we do these two workshops. One's about buying a home, one's about investments. But the ones about buying a home, I think they're brilliant because we're, again, what we do is we, we hand out these viewing pads. And in these viewing pads, we've already listed all of the questions. I shouldn't have done this anyway, shouldn't I? Um, I've actually, I've actually seen, a, seen a copy of it, so I'm all right, I know. <laughs> in these questions, I think they're fantastic. And you all, we've actually included a checklist. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, Stacey was well and truly organised about the whole process here. But, you know, for those that are doing this alone, for us to be able to provide them with a bit more... Than their own gut feeling about what to ask because what everyone forgets is that they go and see a house they go oh, i love it oh the estate agent he was so nice the estate agents work for the seller they're being nice because they're earning a load of commission from you doing the actual viewing so it's best to get all of your questions answered and uh, uh, from the agent and be as prepared as possible ahead of all your viewings and if you can do that then you're going to avoid mistakes, save money, and make sure you make the right decision. I mean, I want to go back to this education because I, I just find it fascinating. I mean, you played for eight different clubs. Did you not receive any form of property education once from any of these clubs? No, none, none at all. I think the only, when I signed for Newport, the only club that even asked about it was Newport and they give you a pack 
and they're really good with that. They give you a pack of schools, uh, areas. You know, it was quite basic, but it was it was something. You know, you turn up and you're like, oh, actually, this is what they're recommending. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've got kids, go to this school, and they were really good at bringing families together. But every other club that I played for, it was a case of you, you literally like I, I signed for Luton, for example, and it's like right, sign the contract. Right, you're in training tomorrow. You've got eight grand relocation. Um, we'll stick you in a hotel, but you've got to pay. That's coming out your eight grand. So you're in a hotel of you know it might be what sixty quid a night, whatever. You're having to eat food from the hotel and go out for for food every night. So this money's chipping away. And then I'm moving to Luton. I've got no idea about the area. There's some some dodgy parts of Luton. I'm sure people at Luton won't won't mind me saying that. But when you when you have no idea about a background, you need someone to say, look, this is a you know this is a good area for you. And I know Luton do do this now, by the way. There's, you know this is a good area for you. What's your budget? What are you, what are you thinking of? Can we you know after training today, I'll sort this for you and I'll take you for four or five viewings, give you a bit of advice, see where other teammates live. But you literally, from my experience, you sign for a club. If it's in the summer, especially you sign in the off season, you've got you've got two weeks or a week. Especially when I was in Wales, for example, I signed and I had a week before I started training. So I was like, right, I've got I've got a week now. I've got two days. I've got to see as many properties as I can. No idea about the area, but you know, I, I need something, so I'll just go and do it. And I think what people forget is these are you know football ages people so much. These are young lads. If you're 25 in any other walk of life, you're a young lad. But in football, you get to 30 and you're seen as an old man for some reason. It's it's mad. But when you're when you're talking about people like this, I was doing this at 19, chucked, chucked into a house. How do, what do I know about boilers or you know uh, what the walls are made of or insulation or what council tax is like or anything like that? It's like right, if you're buying, especially in you go. How much is it going to cost? And we, I think we we forget that these are young lads and a lot come from really humble beginnings. So maybe their families haven't even got this kind of education. You know, I came from a council estate. My family had no idea about property, so they can't really pass it on to me. My my wife's the same. It's quite similar that. Yeah, she was an S Club junior and they were they got money at a young age from 11 till 13 or 14. She was in the band. No one managed that money. So she had access to that money. But one of the lads, his family are not well off, but they, they're quite educated and they come from a different background. They were taking his some of his money and they put it into property. And you look at him now at the age he's at and he's got assets where some of the others, um, you know, were able to spend the money. And as a kid, it must have been unbelievable. Like you could spend money and take your family on holiday and things like that you know some of them used it throughout various points in their life but this lad's actually got assets now that that the other hasn't and it just comes down to the education if you don't know about it and your family don't know about it you you're blind to it we actually work with leaving town now there's a gym there called paul we were introduced to each other by their head of education guy called dal bennett fantastic guy yeah he's a top guy yeah he is he's a really good guy and um and dal introduced me to paul paul and I then had a Zoom call because that's kind of a normal form of uh, communication these days. And, um, and when Luton signed a few of the boys last summer and in the January transfer window, um, they just came to us and we've helped facilitate the, the, quite a few of the rental for the new signings there. And I think that just helps them ease into the club and into a new area a bit better. And by us supporting the club to move one of their players, we're not charging the 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 player and we wasn't charging the club but it just allowed our partnership with the club to grow onto that next level which we've now got and and you mentioned for a screen earlier in the in the in the pod when we were in the talk about the football section i mean i'm very close with a, a lad there called christian doidge who signed for hips from forest green christian had never gone to Edinburgh, but he was also getting this this reload fee i think eight grand spenny stand mm-hmm. across the board but the first thing he did is he flew me out. He says, I can't do this on my own. So I need to buy somewhere and I need to buy something quite quickly. Now I had a two week window of all my research and prep and and I kind of knew the hotspots of where he needed to be. But for me to understand more about Christian, about him and his, if he was married or kids or girlfriend or anything else like that, you know, he put me up in a hotel and he bought my flights, but we actually arranged for, I think we had about eight or nine viewings. Um, we both fell in love with one, thankfully. I mean, it's, it's a different system in, in Scotland because they almost prepare the legal process at the beginning. It's quite clever, actually, in the yeah. and stuff like that. So we were part of this open day, and I tactically asked to be the last one to go in. The lady shows around, and um, Sarah, her name was, and um, funny enough, Sarah was a Hibs fan. 
her dad was a season ticket holder. And it was literally the last question that we asked was, I said, look, I'm going to ask a bit, uh, probably an unusual question. I said, but you don't like football at all, do you? She goes, oh yeah, we love Hibs. I said, well, Christian's their new number nine. And he was, he was their number nine. Thankfully, that just took the conversation to negotiation and we actually managed to agree a sale with the owner directly, he called the agent and said it's sold, do not accept any further negotiations. And it just helped because Christian was absolutely buzzing about this duplex apartment overlooking the ocean, right next to the gym, underground security parking. My job was to investigate the history behind its capital growth. If he ever was to move out on loan, what could he rent it out for? What associated costs are going to come with it? It was great, but I just get so frustrated that if he hadn't have known about me or what MPH Sports do, he would have probably just done this himself. He would have bought the wrong place, probably in the wrong area, probably a four bedroom detached new build a million miles away from absolutely nowhere for a guy who was 26 and single. Mm. But I think as well, for, for, for the football club's point of view, you've got a player moving and signing for a football club. You want him to settle in as quickly as possible. So you want to you want to take some of these things away from him. And I think if you're trying to settle into a new football club and you're thinking at training, oh, you know, my wife's moving soon. She's going to be at home on her own. I'm taking her away from friends. I've got to put my kids in school. I've got all these viewings I've got to go to next. How much am I going to pay here? How much am I paying here? What's the area like? You've got all that in your head. Plus, you've got to go and meet a whole new set of lads and play for a new team. You know, this is why people struggle to settle into football clubs quickly and don't hit the ground running. If you can take some of these issues off of them, and I know when you're at the top clubs, um, they'll do this a lot more for you, but there's so many, you know, there's so many clubs that could just, uh, well, use a service like yours. I think, I think if you, it works both ways. You're helping the players settle into the club and it's going to help you as a football club. But, you know, I don't see why you wouldn't want to do it. I'm going to ask you a question. So I've been to Luton to do a talk with a younger squad, but if I would have gone in, when you was at Luton Town first team, and I would have done a 20-minute property workshop on the first team, do you think, in hindsight, it would have encouraged you to make to have made better life decisions with your money? Yeah, possibly. I think that now I look back, there probably were ways around that I could have used that eight grand better. And as I said, I had five grand in my bank. But because I rented, I was like, oh, I don't need a deposit now for another year, so I'll, I'll forget about that. But I think I just had no knowledge. And I think I look at the flat that I rented in, in Dunstable, it was the area. And it was uh, the only reason I rented it there was because Andre lived in the in the block next to me or in the same block. So he said, Look, I'm living here. So I was like, right, I'll be close to you. We'll live there. That, that flat back then was worth, I think it was worth 100 grand. Might have even been 90, 95 grand in Dunstable. It was a new build flat. So I could have put down 10 grand. I could have... I, got, I ended up getting a credit card, didn't I? So I could have maybe done something there or I had five grand on me. Maybe could have even worked with a football club to say, look, can you pay me this in advance? I think this is where football clubs can really help because you need this lump sum deposit. And for me, I would have, I would have done that if I had the lump sum deposit. Could I have gone to the football club and said, look, can you give me this lump sum and maybe take it off my wages throughout the year just so I can buy this, this property? That property went, I could have got it for, as I said, 95 grand. That's doubled in price uh, since. So I look back and I think I was living there for about a year. I then could have rented it out. I think I think also clubs can start using this as a system. I could have rented it out to the football club and used it for new signings. Instead of putting a lad in the hotel, here's a property that one of our ex-players has or players has. Go and live in there for a little bit. I definitely could have made better decisions back then. And I think I'd have had... I'd been financially, I'd been in a much better position. I wouldn't have had to get myself in debt. Luckily, I got myself out of it. A position at the minute, but it's just that education. And I think it's young lads. Renting seems easy because you're on short contracts and it's quicker. But long term, bit of education, bit of patience and knowing what you're doing. It's going to pay off in the future. Do you remember any particular players that you were surrounding yourself with during football? Um, that had a, like an appetite for, for property? Joby, that I spoke about. I remember questioning him quite a bit because when I when I got to my age of Stephen and John, I knew financially I was in a good position. Materialistic things didn't mean anything to me. Cars didn't mean anything to me. I wanted to save for a deposit and get a house. And I spoke to him and he had, um, you know, he'd been a Premier League player, championship, Premier League captain, uh, played for Jamaica internationally. So he'd earned, he'd earned good money in his career. 
but he was also like really sensible. I think there's a culture in football where people are called tight and it gets to people. But if people couldn't understand that, and not necessarily Joby, but I remember a player that I played with and I won't mention his name, but he played in the Premier League. And when we got to a restaurant, he'd use voucher codes. No voucher codes that you get like a third off your meal or something like that. And you get boys around the table taking the mick out of him. But he's he's one with millions in his bank and you're paying you're paying full price for your meal because your, your ego is too big to go on a voucher code. But this is why people, you know, yes, he's got money, but he's financially he's making good decisions regardless. And I think I spoke to Joby and he's got he, he's got a property, property portfolio, um, both in England and abroad. And yeah, he's someone that definitely had a passion for it. Um, a number of others in my career as well, but more so when I was at Brentford, I think, and back in the day, but because I was so young and it really didn't interest me at the time, I didn't bother to ask any questions. So, but yeah, Joby, Joby definitely was one that I, I fired a few questions into. Cool. You're currently studying, doing a degree. May you share with us what you're studying and, 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 for, and for what end purpose? It's, it's sport and directorship. So it's leadership positions within sport. It's tailored around the sport and director role at a football club. But it's not necessarily, you know, what that degree is for. It gives you, for me, I wanted to understand what goes on behind the scenes at a football club, how it's run, whether that's in a football club or you can take it out to another organisation. I just wanted to educate myself a little bit more. And yeah, this was one that the PFA, I'd spoken to the PFA and said, look, I want to do a university course. Uh, they put a few to me and this was one of them that really appealed to me. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I've done well so far. I've, there's four modules and I've completed three and passed them. So I've got one left. So yeah, hopefully I'll be graduating in the next sort of five, six months. Well, we wish you all the best with that, Fraser. Your, um, your mentality of winning the morning has recently inspired myself, actually, to start running again. I'm not going to lie. I think I think the first lockdown, I don't know how many miles I clocked up, I was uh, felt like Mo Farah. But, um, but this time around, I've really struggled. I think I've just been, when I've been so overworked, I think fitness and health has kind of gone out the window. And, and you've recently put a video on LinkedIn, which, which I know thousands of us watched and I started running again why is this message so important to you I think it's it's personal to me but it relates to so many people and I've had some unbelievable messages off the back of it mm. for me the way the way it started I know a lot of people there's like I think there's a book with the 5am club and a lot of people read that I've not read it so I don't really know but mine wasn't for any reason to become a millionaire or something like that mine was when I came out and I tried to, as I said, I said yes to all these opportunities. So I was, you know, I was working as a scout. So that took me in the evenings. Then I was working in the day. I had games at the weekends. Um, I was studying and I've got a little girl. So I, I, was, I was finding it. I was like, and fitness has been a big part of my life, obviously. Um, and I can still do moderate exercise. And I just found myself getting a bit lazy. And my excuse was, there's not enough hours in the day. Like, I've got all this to do. Then I've got my little girl. And how can I then come in after a game and say to my wife, well, I'm nipping off to the gym now. I was like, how can I do it? And I, but I was still getting up about eight o'clock and thinking that, you know, I need my rest. I need my sleep. And something that I'd always been told, like, get your eight hours and all that kind of stuff. And I was getting up at eight o'clock, but then I had this hectic day. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to get up a little bit earlier because I had stuff that I needed to do before work. And I did it all, you know, from seven to eight. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll keep doing that because it gives me a little bit of time. Also gives me a bit of time on my own. It's a, it's a madhouse when you've got kids and, a, you know, it gave me a bit of peace and quiet in the mornings. And it went from getting up at seven to getting up at five. So I get up at five o'clock in the morning and I, I actually love it. It's one of my favourite parts of the day. I get up, I read. It's, it's, you know, sometimes it's pitch black outside. It's getting a bit lighter now, so it's nice. But I get all my stuff in that I need to get done before match of day starts. So if I want to read a bit deeper now, so I start meditating, things like that, and trying to help my mentality. Uh, if I've got any little tasks that I need to do, if I need to get my, you know, I'm, as I said before, fitness is a big part. So going for a run, going to the gym, I can do all this before anyone else gets up. So it's almost like no one even, you know, I've done all this and then the actual day starts. And I just found it really helps me. Um, I think at first some people might it might take some people to get used to getting up really early. I know you're an early riser yourself. Some people get to, you know, halfway through the day and they're like, oh, no, nah, this ain't for me. But I think if you get past that little stage, you actually start looking forward to getting up in the morning. 
and it makes you make good decisions in the evenings because I came out and I was getting a bit lazy I was having a few beers at night and you know waking up but when you know you've got to get up at five and you're going to be feeling a bit groggy it's, it, you think you know what yeah I'll, I'll wait till the weekend and I'll, I'll give myself a beer then and I won't do it on a Monday night and it just gets you into good habits and I think um it's just something that it's not going to be for everyone but it really helps me and I think if you can if you can accomplish things early in the morning I just think it sets you up for the day because even if you have the worst day possible in that three hours what I do I've already accomplished a few things and ticked a few things and it fulfills me and I think if you do that or just try it it could be you know I've seen some people that can't get out of the house or anything like that but it could be literally getting up and making your bed and you know right that's that's something that's ticked off it could be doing the dishes it could be going out and taking your dog for a walk and you're like you know what it's, it's seven or eight o'clock and I've done three or four things that I'm quite proud of and then it just sets you up for the day and it's yeah it's really helped me uh, yeah listen, I, I completely agree and I used to have that mentality last year so I don't know why I fell back into bad habits again I mean when I wake up at four or five in the morning the first thing I think about is turn the laptop on quick and I've got, I'm almost racing how much work I can squeeze in in a day well actually now just going for a run listen to your podcast what is it called again <laughs> football journeys um for everyone that wants to listen in, it's fantastic but you do you come back like a new person you come back I, I now have breakfast I have not had a breakfast in six months wow yeah now I'm having breakfast again so although I've been only running again this week but I'm now having breakfast it's a new routine um I feel like I've got more energy to be honest mate it's um I don't think I would have fallen back into it when I hadn't watched your video Thank you for coming on the pod. Um, you've had an incredible journey yourself. I can't wish you any more success with your operation. You know, I know what a f- proud family man you are. And, you know, you are inspiring. And I think that once you pass this degree, I think there's going to be some fantastic, fantastic opportunities for you, Fraser. I'm keen to also talk to you about how we can support you with the British Heart Foundation. So do talk to me about that. Maybe we can organise something and maybe we'll bring them in as a as a as a way of us trying to raise some raise some money for them um you know have an open mind on that i'm sure that looking at the sort of clients that we're now very fortunate enough to work for we might be able to put in some some prizes and we, whether we auction them off or sell them off or we, or we arrange some sort of day we arrange some money let's do that because i think that'd be a really great cause and we're all, we're all with you fraser so listen mate just stay strong be positive and just continues to be who you are mate okay no thank you mate i really appreciate it and i think yeah i think it's really good to get your message out there and obviously keep up the good work i think it's as i said on here i could have done with this for years and newport were brilliant for me in that year of retirement but i think if you've got that for someone else it's what you're doing for people i think people come out the game especially and if you can take a little bit of pressure off by someone having a little bit of an income or an asset it does it allows people not to go and jump into a job that they don't enjoy it allows people a little bit of breathing space to have an income. Maybe if maybe it's just their house that they're living in, but they've got something, they've got an asset, and they've got something when they come out of football. And I just think I've seen so many people over the years that come out and they've got nothing and they end up going and doing the first job that they see that they don't really care about and not having the quality of life that they could. So I think if you can if you can be that buffer and that support for someone, you know, when they come out of the game or even during the game, I think it's so important. So no, keep up the good work yourself, mate. Thank you very much. Well, listen, mate, I can't wait to see a new home once you've moved in. It looks yeah. awesome. So, uh, listen, keep in touch, mate, and we'll uh, we look forward to getting together soon. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to Talk Sport and Property. Visit the App Store and download the MPH Sports app today or keep up with us over on Instagram. <laughs>